I've been referring to the fact that culture is not your friend, it is not my friend, and I thought I'd do a little clip of Terence McKenna, who is a very uh, well-spoken, uh, he has a good grasp of this concept, and uh, I think I'll just sort of let him uh, talk a little bit, so um, have a listen. And I'll do a few comments along the way. Uh, in our culture, you know, there are, I have no idea, at least 10 or 20 operating systems all going at the same time. Uh, some will uh, run Mormonism, some will support Catholicism, others uh, Kabbalah goes at the speed of light. Uh, Others support quantum physics, some support econometrics, others support political correctness, and uh, these things are mutually exclusive. And, and so, looking at this, and looking at this clash of operating systems, I've come to the conclusion, and some of you may have heard me say this before, that uh, culture is not your friend. That's the final conclusion. That's a fact. Well, this came to me a few months ago when I had my yearly physical. And as I was buttoning up, my doctor said to me, he said, you know, uh, in the 19th century, uh, most people your age were dead. He's cooking the books here a little bit on this one. Uh, if you... Uh, eliminate infant mortality. Uh, people lived quite to a healthy long age, uh, but because they, they in the 19th century and previous to that, uh, if you take the infant mortality into the statistic, it reduces life expectancy greatly. But now that infant mortality has been reduced uh, substantially, this is uh, not a very good uh, example. But anyway, let's keep listening. And, uh, and I realized that, uh, that this was true and that one of the, among all the revolutions that we are enduring, one of them is that we live nearly twice as long as people lived uh, very recently in the past. Of course, uh, this is his assertion and he's uh, buttering up his uh, point, which I like anyway, but... Uh, this unfortunately is not true. Infant mortality created a, a huge uh, statistical error in how long people lived in the 19th century and previous to that. Well, culture is a kind of neoteny, and I don't want to belabor that at great length, but for those of you who are not biologists, neoteny is the retention of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. It's used to describe animal behavior. For instance, I'll give the most spectacular example of neoteny. There is a kind of animal which lives in ponds in Africa, and it reproduces like a fish. It lays eggs on the bottom of these ponds. More fish-like animals come from these eggs and so forth. However, if the pond dries up, the creature undergoes metamorphosis and becomes an animal somewhat like a gecko and lays eggs, and from these eggs come creatures that are like geckos. In other words, this is an animal which actually achieves sexual maturity in two forms, depending on environmental stress. What he's saying, in a way, is that culture is kind of a chameleon. It'll adjust to the flavor of the time. And uh, in that sense, it can shape the times through an arbitrary, almost, uh, adjustment, which is quite disturbing, in, in fact. Let's listen more. Spectacular example of monotony. Turning to human beings, a less spectacular example, but relevant to us, is our hairless, our general body hairlessness compared to other primates. We look like fetal apes. Uh, human beings look like fetal apes. Uh, why? 
What is neoteny? Well, this is hotly debated among evolutionary biologists. But the point I want to make is a socio-political comment, which is culture itself is some kind of neotenizing force. Because what it, culture provides is a bunch of rules, so you don't have to think, and a bunch of myths, so you don't have to think again. The culture has all the answers, you know. You want to know where people came from? Well, when the sky god got out of his canoe at first waterfall and took a leak, then we, the true people, appeared like ants, and we've been living here in e ever since. Oh. Huh. So you see that uh, culture is something that can be manipulated readily by people who understand this process of being able to influence and uh, direct a population into a certain direction and be completely mesmerized by some kind of uh, mythological uh, harebrain uh, gobbledygook. Gee, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad I asked. Uh, you know, this is what culture does for you. So, but now technology throws a curve. And the curve is that we live so long that we figure out what a scam this is. We figure out that what you're supposed to work for isn't worth having. We figure out that our politicians are buffoons. We figure out that professional scientists are reputation-building, grab-tailing weasels. We discover that all organizations are corrupted by ambition, uh, you know, you get the picture. We information, the information age, technology, I would say it's not technology, it's not the industrial revolution, it's actually the information age where information is exchanged readily and quickly uh, without outside of the control of the mechanisms that used to control how information was disseminated. So I think this is important to understand, not its technology, it's the information age, our the availability of information that is passed amongst ourselves, amongst each other, beyond the control of the powers that used to control it. Let's go on. Figure it out. Well, then, as intellectuals, and anybody who figures it out is an intellectual, believe me, because they're slinging the programming to push you the other way. So, so then intellectuals, defined as people who figure it out, uh, discovered that you are alienated. That's what figuring it out means. It means you understand that the BMW, the Harvard degree, the, whatever it is, that this is all baloney and manipulated and hyped and that mostly you have a bunch of clueless people who are figuring out which fork they should use. Intellectuals figure it out, well, quite frankly, intellectuals figure out nothing. They indicate a situation that prohibits us from understanding. They, they, they can indicate, they can point us into a direction, but the people that actually figure out and understand how to create an impact on a population are the artists. And the artists create visuals that are beyond a uh, kind of mental construct. These are physical realities in the world. They're not words written on a page uh, only, although I, I, I enjoy words written on a page, but the visuals, the closer we get to the experience, the opera, the singing, the uh, dance, those, those experiences are uh, true experience. They're not uh, abstractions in our head. They are actually perceived as real. So I disagree with his intellectual part of it, but nonetheless, we are proceeding. Uh, but this position is presented as alienation and therefore somehow tinged with the p potential for pathology. You know, it's a bad thing to be alienated. Now let's speak for a moment in order to fulfill the promise read by in the introduction uh, about psychedelics and what are they doing in this fine situation. 
Well, what they're doing is, is forcing this maturation process by dissolving boundaries, which is what they do. Now, I'm going to uh, just sort of uh, pause for a moment here because uh, psychedelics is his particular expertise. It's not mine, so I'm going to pause. Continuing now, it, uh, he comes back uh, to the point. Let's hear. And people have seemed to believe that they were fulfilling their responsibilities intellectually. People seem to feel they are doing that when they reject the past. Say, well, you know, that was all screwed up, but since I got with Master Shuggy, I've understood, you know, the way it really <laughs> is supposed to be. No, this is just trading one set of, of neotenizing operating systems for another. The, the real hard choice that you're being pushed toward and that you might consider making before the yawning grave rings down uh, the curtain on this cosmic drama is actually intellectual responsibility, freedom, and uh, uh, a devotion to uh, what scientists call elegance. I just want to say here that uh, the responsibility we have is not intellectual, but a physical reality uh, in the sense that our actions will guide the new age of our consciousness, that we do no longer excuse ourselves intellectually for abdicating our responsibilities towards, for example, the vulnerable, that we become more conscious of ourselves as caring individuals. Now, he is staying in his head, but I'm hoping that he is thinking in these lines. Let's see. A thought. You know, people say, well, how can you tell one theory from another, and is science better than religion, and this and that? After a lot of arm waving, it should be conceded that the final call is aesthetic. That because we are monkeys, because we are so far from God, we, can, we cannot set knowing the truth as the standard for choosing among the models we can produce. This is uh, absolutely incorrect, totally false. We can choose and we are clear on what our objective is. And that is to instigate an era of caring. This is not something that is intellectual as he uh, ended up believing. He uh, uh, separated himself from his true potential, I believe, and it's not an intellectual exercise. I do believe that there is an elegance that we can pursue, but it's not something that is actually uh, reduced to an intellectual conception. It is a real world, real live, you be uh, don't be a prick, don't be a bastard, you know, uh, uh, start acting as an integral human being, what you're capable of doing, you know, the monkey idea is irrelevant in this, it's like what it is that we are as human beings that separates us from being just bloody barbarians, start caring for each other, he's missing this. We must set our aesthetic compass towards the more truth what Wittgenstein called the, the true enough. And then the question is, well, how do you, how do you recognize that? Well, it's easy to recognize. You see it in the eyes of your neighbor. You see when a person is actually uh, enjoys your company, when you are actually confronted with a situation where you help and not hinder. This is what it is. And Wittgenstein notwithstanding, you know, come on, please, people, you know, Terrence, wake up. It's not so complicated. Is you can be a good guy. You don't have to be one of the reptile hyena types that plunder and pillage and rape. Come on. This is a rich field of human study called philosophy of science or theory, epistemology and ontology.
No, 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 no epistemology, study of science. It's real life. It's be a good guy. You know, change your attitude from an intellectual theoretician into a practicing, caring, kind, loving human being. I'm sure he was that. I hope he was that. How, how do we know uh, what is real? But Plato, who all the rest of philosophy is a footnote upon, Plato said, you know, that the key lay in the concepts the good, the true, and the beautiful. The good, what is it? Tricky, tricky, tricky. Not at all tricky. You know exactly. You see, this is where they fall apart, these types. These McKenna types, these loaded DMT, you know, uh, these, these people that, that attract uh, others to the idea that it can be a freebie from the universe. No, you got to work at this. You got to be a good person. You got to actually do the right thing. It's not an intellectual exercise as he ends up. Culture is not our friend because it teaches us exactly what he warned us against but ends up defending. So beware, beware of the uh, Swami Shugis that he talks about because he's being a Swami Shugi in this. He's not actually telling us what it is we need to hear. I'm going to finish off. It's almost done a minute or so. The true, what is it? Trickier, even trickier. The beautiful, what is it? Easy to discern. The beautiful is easy to discern. You are going to be condemned to live out the consequences of your taste. <laughs> really, really. And if you have no taste, you know, God help you. All right, that's, our culture. that's kind of fun. All right, that's fine. Uh, beauty, he reduces it to some kind of uh, uh, personal quirk. It's uh, whatever somebody says. Of course, you know, in Africa, they eat a pablum of some sort of mushed potato thing, and they live off it. And we need, uh, you know, beef. We need hot dogs. We need hamburgers. So, yeah, beauty is a kind of perceptive. It's our ability to perceive, I suppose. But point is, he had a very good point to start with and I continued with him through just to show you how a person like this can actually go off the rails because what is your objective? What is it that culture does not teach? Culture does not teach caring. Remember this, culture does not teach caring. It does everything but the way he ends up as well. He doesn't recognize the simplest of simplest facts. So just remember that.